I think it's yeah, uh, let's see, 13. It says 13 years and then it was the first time I worked on your stuff. So yeah, yeah. then Greg and, and Cox is yeah, yeah, that's right. The first right. Year, so. Yeah, and then, um, then uh, as you know, SDN came along and, and Tom became very sort of central to that. And at Arista and kind of owned that's the, the strategy for yeah. Arista. And then there's now at um, HP or HPE, I guess. Yeah. 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 But the big thing is open switch, and there's you know lots of activity going on in open source for networking right now. It's one of the most interesting things that's going on at the moment, and uh, it's great to have Tom here. He's overseeing and running the whole thing. So thank you for the invite. Right. It's uh, it's an honor to be here to talk to you today. Um, Nick is genuinely one of my my heroes uh, in this thing we do for a living. So uh, just to you know, always follow the, the work we've done. And you guys are just really, really lucky to hang out with them every week. I was hoping this could be a bit of an interactive chat. So I've got a bunch of slides. You probably really don't want to be talking for 45 minutes and answering questions. Um, just jump in at any time. Uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll Nick gave me an intro, but just to give you a little bit of sense of who you're talking to today. Uh, I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, started at HP and Ethernet switching, uh, right out of college, drove all the drivers in the first switch that <coughs> and the Proker line there. A handful of us wandered off the reservation uh, to a startup down in Telecom Valley when there was one. Uh, that startup got acquired by Cisco, spent about a decade on the um, kind of the service provider side. One of the last big pieces of work was that the uh, early architecture and uh, Execution on the ASR 9000, if you know what that's mm -hmm. the scope, one of the big internet core routers. Um, from there, jumped. I, I had worked for J Street Law for uh, a number of years, and she was on that side of the house. A uh, good friend of mine convinced me to come down into the data center and hang out in the Air Force 27 services, uh, everything from TCP proxy to firewall, load mount, to all that kind of good stuff. Uh, spent a, a number of years there, then got um, asked to do the SDN gig with Cisco. That was interesting. Uh, there's no alcohol served here, so yeah, if you want really good stories, we have to go off site. Back. <laughs> um, uh, but you really had a, just a, a you know full career at Cisco, bounced out to Arista, and I've been talking to HP for a bunch of years. Uh, so they asked me to come over and run uh, the global engineering team there. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I'm not going to give you any kind of HP or Cisco or any sort of sales speech today. This is just really about kind of networking and open switch. Uh, please use me as a resource, both here in this meeting and afterwards, as you'd like. Uh, you know, from a raw knowledge perspective, hey, uh, obviously don't stack up to some of the, the folks in the room, but I've been doing this a bunch, made enough mistakes, know enough people. I might be able to provide some feedback if that is needed. All right, so with that, let's, uh, let's jump in. My old Arista call would be locked in. <laughs> okay, um, what I thought we'd go through today is what is the open source project um, and a motivation of goals, really, what the hell are we doing? Uh, you know, the, the community model, design principles, architecture, uh, and how if you want to, there's some slides here at the end, I'll make sure Lisa has these, um, you know, some pointers to how to get going and, and take a look at the code yourself and or join the community. Okay, so why does the world need another network operating system? Oh, there's enough. Right. Probably very more of them that are still alive today. Um, we looked at the the landscape, and although kind of I'm sure everybody heard about hardware software disaggregation and you know ODM based data center switching design and lots of startups bring your own software kinds of efforts going on, we looked at the, the landscape and we said, you know, I think I think we've seen this script before. This kind of feels like servers twenty years ago. So you go back and compute, right? What happened was you had big vertical, fully vertical, vertically integrated systems. So companies made their own CPUs, their own hardware, and their own software. And it was the beginning of an open movement, if you remember back then, which was Solaris and HPX would have been considered kind of commercial representations of Linux, or Unix rather, um, this is pre-Linux. Um, and that kind of moved people off, um, moved them from large kind of mean computer um, mainframe designs into more classic kinds of servers that persisted kind of throughout the 90s, and once 2000 happened, you see the dominance of x86 and Linux um, really kind of can complete that evolutionary phase. So <clears throat> networking and said, yep, I've seen this one before. Um, it's early days, a lot of move, early movement now to disaggregate hardware and software. Uh, some people doing it well, like the biggest web scale guys, uh, enterprise not consuming any product that way, um, but you can see the, the door open, you see a bit of a crack. 
Um, but what we, when we looked at the landscape, we said, you know what, what's missing is networking's version of Linux. Um, no one had put enough effort into a community body um, to, to get that uh, get that kind of offer in the, in the industry marketplace up and running. So, uh, so, so I heard Andy Bechtelsheim say the same thing, I don't know, seven years ago. And so I was like, oh, you know, so we're going to make, we're going to make, you know, our own open network operating system. And they made, made EOS turn out not to be open. But, but in the last nine years, we've had uh, open network Linux. We've had uh, Cumulus. Yeah. We've had you know, Switchlight and Indigo and, and all these sorts of things. And so like it's, it's not quite as, has, has it. It, it's not quite the same way it was. I mean, I think this this pitch would have been true nine years ago, but in 2016, you know, there's a fair amount of development in this area, and we have kind of these at least in the we have both in the box network operating systems like Cumulus and Open Linux, and then we have out of the box like Onus. So where does could you you know sort of yeah, explain sure. like like so, where where the where the missing piece or, or where this big gap you're seeing is today? Sure. So first, I'd come to Andy's defense a bit. Uh, I'd say I think EOS does have um, it's more open than anything that ever preceded it from a market share perspective. Oh, yeah, yeah. I used you to can get in, you can add software. Um, <laughs> so I, I think yes, not all the code is available as open source, um, but I, I think that was probably very pivotal in terms of open systems, if you will. Um, yeah. The other efforts you mentioned are still pretty small scale in nature, right? So these are efforts, you know, some of the ones you referenced have less than 10 people working on them, right? The biggest ones have a couple few dozen. Uh, a network operating system is an expensive proposition to build. Most of the time, if you were to go look at successful new NASAs, um, it takes, usually you're going to get north of 200 people. Um, before you get something that's really ready for production in an enterprise kind of environment. It doesn't mean in web scale you can't take a bits and pieces of, of a few pieces of open source code, put it together and operationalize it, but those the customers that have been able to do that, um, they are software engineering firms in their own right. Right. So they're not the typical isn't, you know, factories in the Rust Belt or a 40, 40 uh, law office kind of firm. Um, just the people that have fairly modest IT and middle real software engineering expertise to speak of. There there isn't an alternative today outside of Cisco Juniper, Bouquet, and Arista um, from an open systems perspective. So, again, I put EOS as most open of the bunch. Um, still not truly open source, um, but those other efforts are still pretty nascent and small. So, what was the opportunity here to very succinctly answer your question? To get really serious. So, uh, not something we uh, um, we often talk about, but you know, with this group of people, I don't mind sharing. There's over 250 engineers trying to this right now to continue to grow. So it's just the raw amount of firepower um, that we put on the problem is this is before we're looking at the community participation, which is starting to go like this now, right? So once you start to get to that hundreds of people growling around something, then I think you can create something meaningful from an office perspective. Anything short of 100, you know, that's my opinion. Fair enough? Okay. Um, so a lot of the, some of the open source efforts that have happened today has been on fairly simple systems. Um, things that are single CPU kinds of boxes, uh, fairly limited uh, protocols and feature sets. Um, one of the, the, the first principles we took in open switch was this has to be a real NOS. It has to be able to grow up into multi-CPU systems, HA, ISSC, these kinds of things. Full suite of layer two, layer three, we're off, uh, we're gonna look at that. Um, we thought that uh, it was time, especially looking at the customer set um, that's interested in, uh, say, non-traditional, non-legacy approach to networking. We thought that um, the configuration interfaces being stable and programmatic by nature were super, super important. There are many large customers in enterprise networking now that don't want to ever touch CLI with the box of support. They really, everything is through um, either their configuration scripts or their troubleshooting scripts. So providing a really stable interface for that. And then just kind of looking around and looking at some of our friends, um, we decided to base a good part of the system, and I'll talk about it, off OBSDB. This isn't to say that we think there's some sort of miraculous you know, alignment between virtual switching and physical switching. Um, that's a bit kind of serendipitous and a secondary effect. But the, the, when we look at what it means to build around a, an in-memory state database, I'll talk about um, architecture and how it's different than many NOSs when we get that section, but we wanted to start with the right um, the right kind of component tree. And we looked at some 
some adaptations of things like Redis. You guys know that that package. Client libraries need a lot of work. Turns out OSDB. Um, we were friends with some of the maintainers, and it actually had a lot of supporting capability um, for things that you need to deal with in a system, within a system. Things like you know fast producers, slow consumers, fast consumers, slow consumer tubes, all these kinds of problems had already had a good, good laugh in that in head start. So we had all that up. Um, but we don't we don't want didn't want to do it strictly on our own. So you know in our world the code is the coin of the realm, right? Um, so we put enough resourcing in, enough expertise and muscle in to get this going. But it's being done in a very kind of open source friendly, open source first approach. Um, we you know we went to the first release at LinuxCon, which is Broadcom support. By now, Cavium, Mellanox, Barefoot, everybody's jumped in. Uh, we have honest to goodness competitors, uh, classically speaking, if you will, working with us right now, trying to plan kind of their 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 apex and how they they join the party. And, and for us, we will we will make it a level playing field as competitors join the effort. It, the whole idea here is to get momentum and get product shipping on this, um, which is trying to be strict in control. And again, you make some trade-offs, but that's okay. Um, Here's some stats on what's going on in the community. Like I said, we did the beta release in October. First production release is coming up in June, uh, and we're you know, we're seeing we're seeing some of the uptick. Uh, we would love to get more universities involved. I think that's fertile ground for new new kinds of um, technologies like this. So, everybody here is obviously welcome. Any questions so far? Yes. So you said mostly Apache 2.0. Now that sounds a little bit. Hmm. Or what do you mean by mostly? Well, the Linux kernel, for example, is GPL. Right, but what parts are not Apache? And oh, why? so all the new code we're adding is Apache 2.0. But there's pieces, lots of there's lots of GPL pieces in there. Okay, so it's so, a combination of GPL and Apache. Yes. And we do work, for example, in Quagga, which we would just been GPL. Correct. We have to give back to the, the Quagga Foundation. Okay. The Quagga effort. So where where things were GPL, we obviously they stay GPL and we contribute back. Okay. New code we're doing under Apache 2.0. The, the, the way, in effect, I was talking to one of the DVPs of my competitors this morning that's joining, and, and um, the, the the theory is kind of like this will go probably something like an Android, right? If we're successful, where you have you know, OpenSwitch.net is kind of like the kernel that will work, right? <clears throat> or the the Android repository we have periodic releases that go along, and then companies will take that. Which is why we made it Apache 2.0 because we want to allow for a variety of productization op options. We think some companies will take it and actually do their kind of their versions. Like you know, this I got a Samsung phone. This is not ship as you know with straight Android at all, right? It's been, been modified. So we expect some of that will happen. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, okay. Hundred eight people. Hundred. Hundred engineers, right? You're so cute. Oh no, uh, oh, I, uh, I, my team. There's actually over two hundred, and then plus. Two. But it's just it's a lot of muscle. How many that we need to do? I'd have to get you the answer. Okay. okay. Handfuls of actual people writing code right now. Okay. These are the, the set of folks who came together in the early days and said. Put their logo on it. But I don't care about that. Okay, so let's talk about <laughs> that. It is interesting though that Arista is there, right? Because they could have open sourced all of this, but they have some involvement in open source, which is interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good, good team, good friends. So, uh, what you find in networking is we all know each other. You either know everybody on a first first degree <laughs> basis, or they're good friends of somebody else. So. Most of us all work together in different companies with different logos, kind of tend to call each other up and hang out. Quick question. Yes. So in the previous slide, or the one before that, you had L3 as one of the major areas that you're looking at, right? This one. Yeah. But in that list of companies that you showed, I don't see any major L3 players. So, players. Uh, Quagga is fairly anemic. Okay? So what we're doing right now is we're piling code into there. Um, we're also talking with two other companies that have um, one, especially, has a very rich unicast stack, including a stable and well deployed version of BGP. Um, 
working with uh, some of these other guys to see how they how they might want to join and contribute their code. Um, so there's and again they could they could contribute you know a version of it that's scale limited and so people on more licenses they could put it all on open source they have to go through their own business model analysis but right now what you get in in L3 and open source land is not it's pretty far off where an EOS or an iOS or a Junos is today. Right. But are those companies that you talked about, do they also have the intellectual property for all the things that they want to bring? Uh, yeah, so we have um, certainly some, so it's, it's a mix of um, people joining and helping out new open source work versus there's a couple of people going, okay, I've got all this stuff, am I going to cut it loose and when? So we're still, we're still early days. The strategy on the partnership was just go get a bunch of code written rather than run around and try to tell people they need to pay attention and we're nice guys and, you know, um, that kind of stuff, just go crank out a bunch of code. And then, you know, once it sort of worked, then pick your head up and go, okay, who, who would like to be part of the party? And we're in the, we're in the <coughs> phase right now with the next step of partners. Like the, all the silicon providers, that was an easy, an easy add in for, um, but it's, if you think of all the logos that I would normally compete with every week, um, it's to what degree and when do they join? Okay. Cool. Um, architectural principles. Uh, quick show of hands. Who, who in here has worked on network operating systems before? Okay, good. So uh, you, you know the problem of any code that's successful, right? Which is uh, you have an event that comes in, you have a port that comes up, for example. And there's a bunch of people that care about it. Traditionally, there's a port manager. Port manager tells a spanning tree that something's going on. You know, these events tend to ripple through the system. And, and what most of these successful code bases have become over time is a fairly um, intense and spaghettiized version of serialization. You know, you know, I grab your sum up or you grab mine, you create a, a blocking IPC message. So when I get the event, you stop until I get done processing it. A lot of evolution and how the applications and us work together. So when we when we looked at open source, we said, no, 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 no. Um, we're going to start different this time. We want to start with some of the fundamentals of a large distributed web application, where it is instead of a kind of a messaging event driven sort of programming paradigm, it's more of a state processing data model, object model, state of those objects you need. You're subscribed to those states, the pub sub model, you subscribe and you get notification, you deal with it. Should sound familiar to you, Tyler, right? Um, to be honest, there is I think, three or four lines of code in network operating systems that have mm -hmm. some architecture, so not like open switch is new and somehow miraculous, but it's actually just the basic design principle has been done and done successfully um, other places. Um, pretty much everything is in user space. Uh, very, very little in the kernel. So if we take a fault and we don't bounce the box, uh, you can do stateful recovery of the various different processes. And I'll show you um, what those look like. Um, it's pretty hard, hard partitioning and boundaries between the code that needs to talk to hardware and code that doesn't. Um, and then again, from a development methodology, um, really do really be friendly to the, the various open source um, bodies of code and or other projects that we work with. So we actually work in what we call an upstream first sort of branch structure where you're developing on the on the main line that actually is public. And then you know when we have to do some integration and test watch we'll later on sync that code back down inside the four walls if you will and test it sort of thing. But we try to do keep our design discussions and our, our code out there in the open um, as a first Okay, I'll walk through this a little bit. And then I'm sure there's got to be some questions in the room. Um, the heart of the system, as I mentioned, is this OVS DB server. Again, not to be confused with the research in the kernel, it's really the configuration or the control plane module from, from OVS. Everything else is a processor and application around it on a variety of themes, whether they're protocols, fan monitor, port map, um, port manager, VLAN manager. Etc. Etc. Um, we um, we co-opted switch D and put kind of formalize the the um, the translation layer in the top from the database schema to a set of ASIC or hardware specific um, configuration commands. So today, 
this this piece of the system, this would be where your, your Broadcom SDK goes, your Mellanox SDK, and SDK, those kinds of things. But mostly, these ASIC SDKs have a, uh, they do have some low level component uh, in the kernel that talks to, talks to the hardware. That, that's the, that's not creation from an open switch perspective, that's just how the Broadcom SDK works, so we don't change that. Um, we also have a version, most of the development for open switch is done just in a VM on your laptop. So there's a, a mini net, you can simulate many, many switches to bring up the protocol, test it, those kinds of things. So most of what the team works on, and rather than work on real hardware, this is a, you know, that's like a soft, software ASIC, um, is how we do most of the development. So obviously if you're, if you're doing the, the driver specific work, you need real hardware, but if you're developing Fanny Tree or BGP or OSPF, and those kinds of things, there's no reason for you to be on real hardware. <laughs> Um, skip the legend. Uh, you see um, a couple different, a couple different ways to get to and configure the, the, the uh, a system. First left corner there. So we decided to provide a traditional um, CLI uh, offer for NetOps for the people. Uh, REST, if you will, to kind of think about it, map into modern kind of buzzwords. Um, so going to be more DevOps approach. Um, there is some SMT in there, and there's actually a GUI as well. Why would you put a GUI on something like this? Because ultimately, you know, you, you, we go to conventions, we have booths, we, we have <laughs> salespeople who want to show a customer, and showing people CLIs is really boring. Really <laughs> so, yes, I paid a few people to build a GUI on it. Are there a lot of lawsuits there. around around CLIs at the moment? <laughs> uh, no comment. Yeah. I, actually, I, 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 have I, a, I have a personal professional policy not to read competitive patents or lawsuits. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that. I'm sure, I'm sure someone in legal knows about but I, I'm not worried about it. I used to work at a company that worked really, really hard to make something that was completely compatible with the CLI, and well, we all know how well that worked out for them. <laughs> yeah, I, no comment. Um, I, I do know what's really comforting to me is I walk out of my cube, and I look 300 feet down the hallway that way, 300 feet down the hallway that way, and it, it's lined four deep, five deep with patent plaques, hundreds of feet. So I... I very, I, I get to keep company with 20 years of intellectual <laughs> property. Um, so I, you know, those are those are my 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 best friends. Um, okay, now come on and us that. Uh, questions on the architecture? So, how important, I guess, do you see it as uh, you know, sort of, you know, the, the legacy side of things, making things that are compatible with the Cisco switches that we know and love or hate in the you know, existing internet architecture versus the SDN side of things, and, and sort of what's your kind of relative prioritization of this and, or your mind share? So I have to make sure I'm out of reach of Mr. Uh Okay, so first, she, at the end of the day, who's going to pay us for doing the work, right? Um, the people that still procure network equipment today are the very classic and mostly it's a network operations team, right? Um, you can look at certain go-to-market motions where you know, a line of business and a large corporation has a new app, they go to IT, tell IT they're going to dictate the IT stack, but for the most part, switches and routers are just bought by network people. So you have to give them what they're familiar with, otherwise it's really, really hard, right? Um, so, answer 1A, got to look, feel, smell on the same kind of protocols um, like a traditional device. Now, the difference is, is that if you take something like Cisco's iOS that's been developed over the course of 25 plus years, right, it's, it's evolved through every kind of phase and, and trend in network architecture and design, so it has you know, this 25 years of history, features and capabilities. Most, you know, you don't, obviously, every current customer today it doesn't need every feature ever written in all the network operating systems to be developed in the industry, right? So things have, have normalized down to a more a more stable set. Um, for example, I hope you've never trilled this thing. But, um, the kind of answer 1B to your question is, what do I think about SDN? Um, I think we went through kind of the, the classic hype cycle curve on SDN, and it's, it, it means it's kind of in a mixed state <coughs> many customers now. Um, what people seem to have centered around is programmability, um, the ability to be orchestrated. So for a network 
port device to be orchestrated say, part, as part of how a compute node got placed or, or brought online. Um, the, the where we started many years ago that you know, BGP and Spanish Tree were coming off the switch and we're going to be rewritten and running on that centralized controller. I personally, since the technologist, I personally don't think that will ever happen. Like there, there's an example of one or two people doing it. I don't think the majority of networks are run that way. I think we're stuck with BGP4 um, probably forever. It's a long time in the industry. Um, but that, that's just my take. That um, Feedback? I guess they, maybe it's another sort of strategy thing, but, but uh, from what I'm from what I'm, I'm gathering, this looks like, it looks like the good, news, the good news of making something that's fully legacy sort of compatible is that this can really replace your proprietary stuff within HP, your proprietary legacy stuff, ideally. That seems like the goal. I mean, it seems like it would be a good thing, certainly. Yeah, this, um, honestly, this, this, this body of code is getting, getting adapted fairly broadly within our company. I was not getting into the company's skills here, but um, yeah, we're, it, we're, we're using it. Um, uh, I, do, I, I do believe that when you design around a data model like we have, and that's available through either natively through OBSDB as a protocol or through REST, um, it, it, it lends itself um, much more intimately to kind of a DevOps, what I would call a modern SDN or software defined data center sort of approach. But I, I still think that most customers will will turn on training tree, or they'll turn on BGP or something. Um, I think that's how things are going to be for a long, long time. So if a user is going outside of the or that's not part of the So, why you would say no? But I'm saying, uh, is it part of the current scope in phase two plus, or is it um, phase Cisco phase five? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, you actually, your, your last day was last week, right? So, um, we can have a chat uh, uh, over more alcohol. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I certainly, you know, one of the things I guess I've I've learned is if you if you if you if you're successful with a, a, a product or a body of code, people do things with it you never expected. Right? Things only kind of stay normal in the way you anticipated it when not too many people jump in the boat. Um, so I expect um, it to evolve. Uh, you know, there's, there's. If you take a look, there isn't necessarily a great, um, a great body of work if you want to do, um, you know, kind of build devices, say an SD WAN, for example. Right? So this, this, to me, it makes a lot of sense. A body of work like this to use as a basis um, for a richer software forwarder. Um, certainly, it could be applied to switching and routing in areas outside of data center. Uh, Right now, the focus is get this running in data center. That's where the first, kind of there's the most customer interest, if you will, in something new and something fresh. Um, routing and, and switching outside the data center still has fairly traditional views with customers. So uh, I think if we're successful as a community, it'll, it'll go, it'll work. And can you say a little bit about why OVSDB and how tied the architecture is to that specific choice? Um, people may not know what OVSDB is. Uh, so some people will, and some people won't. Yeah. So uh, I'll get right back. So uh, again, we wanted to build. We wanted to build around an in-memory um, database. We wanted a pub sub sort of model. Uh, the why OVSDB was because we were running fast and. It was the laziest, easiest choice mm -hmm. um, to make, right? So actually, the first prototype we did, like I said, we built we built our own client libraries around Redis, and that was just going to be a ton of work. So OVSDB had client libraries and Python and C, and you know, just it was there to grab, and it had the beginning, kind of the beginnings of a of a switch data model in it. Mm -hmm. that we just went and extended. Okay. Um, we happen to know, you know, Justin and Ben over at VMware, mm -hmm. uh, the guys that maintain OVSDB, you know, we're friendly. Lots of the performance problems we saw with it, they agreed, mm -hmm. and we're interested in finding solutions to some yeah. of the distributed, um, kind of multi multi CPU HA scenarios. They were also interested okay. in solving. So it was just a bit of good piece to start from, good people to work with, uh, just go off and run like hell. Obviously, can always be done with Jack's So. So yeah, I was gonna say to answer the question he asked you, 
actually the new evolving standard is right in the center of your slide. And OBSD we sort of for whatever reason I think has ended up being a rallying point for a lot of the new orchestration stuff. And I think if we ignore the data plane for a minute, right? The key word in everything you said is basically end-to-end -end orchestration of networks. The underlying physical network is important, but I think virtual networks on top of those physical underlays is the interesting Agreed. space, right? And I think just like we <coughs> obviously we started for a very simple reason, but I think if enough opportunities keep coming up where people define schemas collaboratively on that, it's going to become sort of the new BGP. Yeah. Basically, it's a transport. Right? Yeah, it's a transport. You, you create the data model to transport. Right. I mean, it does have certain issues around it may not be as reactive as a large system distributed protocol model, but I think we are working around those problems. And when you're starting to talk more about orchestration, some of those problems are not that interesting anymore to solve. So I think that is sort of becoming the new standard. We'll have to wait another five years and see. If enough good schemas get written on top of OBSD, that will become sort of the new Yeah, it, it, it seemed to have some momentum. I think it OBSDB is more like the new NetCon for SNMP. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like a, <laughs> actually, I, mean, no. I mean, BGP, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But, but OBS, OBSDB uh, itself I mean, defines the in-system behavior in a way that NetCon did. Correct. I mean, you can build full routed networks using OBSDB. There are already schemas. We've built those already. We've built code for it. Yeah, so I mean, you can do L2 reachability. You can do L3 reachability. The thinking mostly is most of the reachability is known beforehand. So that's where the orchestration angle comes in. But you're still programming reachability, not just how physical ports are associated with these networks. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. Other questions? Other questions? Have you done a performance for you? What's the implementation? So the performance is an active, um, an active task right now. So uh, it wasn't bad. But it wasn't what we needed the first kind of. It was a, so it wasn't all obvious to be small, right? It was a combination also of some of the, the protocol that BGP that we had stitched into it, the way that we've done the initial integration. Uh, we've um, we've made substantial reforms in the first three weeks. I don't know uh, just because I did the I did the report every week. I just looked at the. In all the test cases, what they're doing. Um, so, so it's like measures for performance involved. Mostly, it's mostly think of it as transaction percentage. So, how, how quickly can you get 10,000 routes up and stable distributed in multiple components? Yeah. <laughs> if you look at you know just using OBS VS Cuddle with with um, you know Open V Switch out of the box, it, it it becomes linearly slower with every port you add. So, you know, imagine you're using a port. Making a chassis switch with OBS, you know, the existing OBS kill would be completely impractical. I see this in you know, when I try to add a thousand of ports to an OpenV switch instance, that it gets slower and slower. And people yeah. complain to me, why does it take an hour and a half for me to start up one? Well, no, it's actually it's actually OBS DB, but it's not actually OBS DB. It's actually the yeah. software OBS VS kill that talks to OBS DB that every transaction it reloads the entire database, so it becomes linearly and ends, becomes an n squared thing. Basically. Yes, there, there was there was a bunch of those kinds of issues that. We had to tackle. Um, yeah, the last thing you know, the, the last thing an application wants to do is when one of you know fifty thousand objects change, just to get it both notified, you're gonna go figure out which one it was. All these kinds of problems. Yeah, so it'd be nice to see that end up upstream to OBS if possible. I know some of the performance changes. I think we're upstream about two weeks ago. I don't. I don't know the exact kind of day by day status on this stuff. So you mentioned before that Quagar is that you're contributing back to Quagar. So Quagar is the kind of the default or the assumed way that BGP works in this. Is in the for now, yes. Yeah, um, but that is um, in what way is that sort of tied to OBS? So it's Sorry, really, OBS, so OBS. so rather so think of it instead of doing file based configuration, uh -huh. right? You're, you're, it's actually it's been integrated to to get its configure to push its mm -hmm. its events through. The database. Uh -huh. Okay, so a replacement of Quagga based BGP is where, where does that take place? That's in in a, in a daemon that gets kicked out and replaced. Yes. So, yeah. Right. So there's so one. So for example, there's a, there's a a young promising young company that you know was mm -hmm. thinking about putting their code in, mm -hmm. doing exactly that. So yeah. You know, yeah. 
OVSDB itself, the data model doesn't change, it's just what's inside the data. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I really like this acquisition. I'm so excited that I actually joined this process this month. Oh, good. <laughs> so you're one of the early ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm one of them. How's it going? Give me, give me some, some unfiltered feedback. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but uh, we got it. I, I want to piggyback on that performance discussion. I, mean, I, I love this idea to have a single database. But uh, if we are looking at the web architecture, Trend these days, they are talking about microservices instead of having a single database in the middle, having the multiple databases and let them ma maintain the databases and have some, you know, then it comes to top provider. Do you have any thought or idea to apply that architecture to this top open source? So I'll tell you honestly, kind of how we think about it and we can get back and forth a little bit. So the, the way we We've looked at it as there's um, really kind of a database needed per CPU. Right, so in a switcher router, you've got a, say a management card it's running this code. And if there's another one in the chassis, it's running another copy. Of it. The problem statement is if we're going to deal with, with redundant controllers in a, a switch, is getting database needs to be stateful between both of those and have the applications sync. This is, this is a, if you look at why it's so hard, hard to take a single fully HA um, distributed chassis, uh, is that exact problem. Because what, what you know, if you go back to systems did is, and, and so I knew what the rep team on the other side needed to know, and we, we did the replication between those. And it was you know, feature by feature. <coughs> is to just go to a distributed database model per per node and have the database sync. And then the, app, the applications actually, you can you can kind of figure out which one needs to run where and whether they've all been started at the same time or not. Um, an orchestration system will see each one of these, um, either a single CPU or a cluster of CPUs acting as, a, as, a, as one system, will see these as a bunch of distributed um, control points that they have to manage. Now, in truth, you could write an application that sits outside that actually subs that subscribes to a given instance of OESDB and, and pull events off it if that's what you wanted to do. We've actually looked at some, some kind of orchestration software like this. You know, these applications, this is location independent compute, right? You're, just, you're, you're responding to the updates on objects that you care about. So you, you actually don't have to um, closely bind them, um, but that's just how we think the early days should happen. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Could you not use the, the, the sort of the OBSDB replication through that something like um, ONOS uses, or um, I mean, essentially the you know the pre the precursor to that of Onyx is this thing. Nib. You know, I, I haven't. I mean, put my head into that. Trying to understand. Trying to do the same problem. Oh, you're working yeah, because it actually, in a, in a sense, might it might provide you with a. Nice framework that exists with us. It's open source. I know it's picked up the user. Yeah, part of the um, that, that's a that's a great suggestion. Part of the trick is, as you know, <laughs> working this stuff right. You know that there's uh, if you're doing um, systems with multiple control plane components, um, which versions of which app are actually active mm -hmm. in the system at any one time. It's not as black and white as you would think, right? If you want to do great restarts, you want to do staple um, staple failover, then you have to. You know, the other version of this has got to be kept warm with certain things. Obviously, certain protocols are not caught the TCP or hope you haven't let them need to initialize them yet. So the, the full kind of distributed system, fully redundant sort of route processor is a, is a good bit of work. Obviously, not going to attack it. I don't want to derail you, but I'm hoping you'll get to talk more about the how you do the distribution and replication and distributed state management. Okay. I don't want to derail you because we've been on the slide, but I hope you will get the chance to talk about this distribution and replication and state management of ODSDB because that'd be very interesting. Uh, I actually I didn't bring a bunch on that today. To be honest, it's a it's it's active work in progress in the community. There's a couple of folks jumping in, so that would be with a the as you mentioned, you'll certainly need it if you want this want to build this into a chassis. Yeah. So we um what we did what we wanted to do was 
get to kind of a healthy layer two, layer three stable product this calendar year, and then look at look at kind of distributed systems or chassis as a as a phase two. It's an argument that you, know, you can't you can't engineer high availability and replication into a system after you've made it after you've made a you know single instance system that does a huge amount of work. On the other hand, I, I think you know just making your since you you bottleneck everything on something that's like the when sort of resembles the Windows Windows system registry, even though it's more reliable. You know, making that a distributed database as the adding first to EOS, you know, seems like certainly the obvious way to move mm -hmm. forward. And that's the uh, uh, so the early. I'm trying to, I don't know if this is on their, their public form yet, but the blueprints for a multi CPU system and the stateful replication of the OBS database has been, last I checked, was accepted by the OBS DB maintainers. You know, it's certainly not been completely implemented yet. But, but what we decided, what we wanted to do was go ahead and start the long time activity of solving the core software infrastructure problem and then worry about how you adapt it to a bunch of protocols and do different system layers. But yeah, the replication work is going on. How do you build networks without needing a lot of state replication? What's that? How do you start thinking about building networks without hmm. needing a lot of state replication? Uh, yeah, I haven't figured out how to build a chassis, for example, without without replicating the state. But what do you think? It's hard. So everything is state, right? But I think your whole model of putting a database at the center and then distributing the database will still not answer the question of you want to replicate all the data or Absolutely. you're able to That's normalize true. it into like you only want to replicate each of the information and then That's there's right. a CPU on every line called that processes it and programs the hardware data. Right. Or do you want to program the hardware data state? I mean there are different trade-offs and some are less silly than others. Yes, yes. And that to be honest, we haven't thought through the the uh, the fully enumerated detailed list of what we want to replicate and what we want. Just because we're really focused on top of racks right now. Want to have one CPU, not to worry about it. Question. Okay, it's so five minutes left. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, tell uh, me. I've seen support for OpenFlow. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate a little <laughs> bit more on that one and support drive it for P4? Okay, so uh, from an OpenFlow <laughs> perspective, obviously it's fairly straightforward to talk right into the the the, the switch D. Yeah. Um, we. I, I think it's supported in the production release coming up in June. I'll have to double check. Um, uh, however, a lot of what you might want to do with OpenFlow, where we've seen OpenFlow mostly used, is for exception handling. And um, to be honest, the the ACL implementation in the first release still has a ways to go to get to the second release to have more functioning ACLs um, actually hooked up and exercised through the SDK. So I'm not sure. Uh, kind of the, this this next coming release. Not sure how whether people will believe it has enough um, ACL richness to actually uh, do the kinds of things you would want to do with OpenFlow. Well, you know, I mean, from, so from our perspective, working on on a network operating system, an SDN operating system, it's it's actually sort of nice uh, to have you know OBSDB and OBSD switch D because in theory. It should be very compatible with software implementations of OBS. We should just yeah. be able to connect it. To it actually, the schema is an, exten yeah, the, ex is an extension. So of hopefully, the, the schema hopefully should just work. You drop in a hardware switch and to to an, an SDN operating system that looks just like a V switch, which is great. Yeah. yeah, and the piece I, I to be honest, I didn't look before I came today. Piece, it's it's really how it's integrated in the ASIC specific driver. If you haven't yet hooked up the pads, like there's. There's at least one vendor's major vendor's SDK that really you your open flow match rules end up kind of going down through their TCAM path. And if those pads haven't been hooked up, then it's kind of hard. But I'll go back and check, see where we're at. Yeah, because that would be nice, especially in the deployments to have something, you know, that to legacy protocols on one side so that can really substitute a device that is out there today. Right. And, but at the same time, talk open flow, that would be very, very nice. Yeah, the challenge with that would be what level of open flow is most hardware support. And I think Tom sort of 
hinted at that. <laughs> the challenge is there isn't a lot that natively will do open flow at terrible speeds and do all the things well, like uh, open, that's another thing. Yeah, sure. open switch, the software we switch can do 100% open flow. It's all software. Yeah, not, 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 not aware where we've, because I think, you know, we have fairly rich SDN controller and an app ecosystem app store. And, and to be honest, one of the big problems that we've solved is people actually, or we've seen, we've seen and we've had to solve um, as people really start to use OpenFlow and software applications is TKM ordering. Yeah. So you could have one app's policy or one command's policy override the other. Like, hey, I want to copy all into a tunnel on this port. And the next command says, no, nope, something else, right? And so you get <coughs> most of these cams are just, you know, it's a it's an ordered um, response you get back out. So resolving the policy conflicts and getting those programmed correctly um, is pretty important to actually to make it useful in real life. Again, that's where you have to, I don't know where we are, and I, I'm fairly certain we have, we did not put, on our SDN control, we have kind of a policy compiler. It takes in everybody's kind of CAM request, crunches the right order. I know that's not in this code yet. It's not an open flow problem, it's an app problem. What's that? Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, no, I was saying, what about P4? Is that... Oh, P4. Uh, so the guys at Barefoot are putting it in. Um, what is our status the last couple of weeks? I don't remember. Uh, that's all I know, actually. That it's uh, there as, the, um, as a means of expressing the forwarding behavior that's yeah. been done in an open source way, an open source P4 code. Yeah. I, I believe it's all present and visible. We. Um, we, 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 we are generally supportive of P4 and would like to see that model stabilize and open switch. Um, we think there's some truth to um, use cases wanting to express themselves as a P4 kind of template. Uh, and candidly, you know, and a lot of the switching silicon we build, we actually have to use a lot of network processor engines in our own chips. Um, that's how we do all the open flow and SDN stuff we do today. Um, and we, we actually, we tend to think kind of like P4 wants you to think anyways, or OpenFlow wants you to think as well. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, create your tables, match, action, step, iterate through. Um, so we're just, we're running really fast right now, but I'd like to see P4 more, and kind of more normally and more regularly adopted in this code base. Um, the biggie would be to see how to glue something like Broadcom's SDK underneath that. All right. So you, know, you mentioned the sort of evolution towards, you know, from proprietary Linux on proprietary hardware, or sorry, proprietary Unix on proprietary <laughs> hardware, proprietary OS right. on proprietary network hardware, open source network OS on hardware. But we're really not on the commodity of hardware. I think I think P4 is, is like, I mean, I mean, Nick can speak as to various goals of P4. The way I see it is that P4 is a goal, is a way to get into an x86 for networks, which is to say where you can compile a program, a P4 program or a C program, and you know it's going to work the same on different pieces of hardware from different switches. Yeah, I would say that a little bit differently, actually, which is that, you know, if you think about it from an open source project like that, like, like this, then it, it benefits you to have a representation of the ASIC. You notice if you go down the right-hand side, it just starts to talk in terms of ASIC. Right? Yeah. But, you know, that could be open vSwitch, it could be an FPGA, it could be, you know, whatever it happens to be, or it could be a Broadcom or Marvel or, or Mellanox or a switch, a switch chip that's in there. The problem is they've all got different models, they've all got different ways of representing forwarding, they've all got different APIs. Some of them you can only get under, you know, multiple levels of NDA, and it just gets a mess to incorporate into an open source. It's been one of the biggest inhibitors to open source things happening in the past. If you look at what happened to FBOS, you know, a valiant attempt gets completely shut down because no one actually wanted to make any of the APIs open enough for it to actually be uh, be useful. So, you know, the idea here is you can express in an open language the forwarding that you're actually doing. So you could use P4 to express the forwarding of a otherwise closed chip. Just take the data sheet, encode it in P4 or any of the closed chips, and then say that is the model. Now I can actually test out and do development with that model. And so I actually have pretty high faith, uh, high faith that I can actually do regression testing and all of these things that you would like to be able to do in order to develop the open source code. That you could then modify that and then put it, you know, put it down into a programmable chip, whatever it happened to be, whether it's like x86 or an FPGA or, or a P4 optimized compiler target. Um, 
you know, that's a kind of an added benefit. But I think I would imagine at this stage, just having a means to have an open source representation of what the forwarding does is a good development vehicle. Right? And that seems to be how it's being used largely, right? Just me as specifying forwarding, even if it actually is specifying something that's fixed in nature. Um, I think you're in, in some ways expressing what I was trying to say. Yeah, okay, in, good. In, okay. A, in, a, in a better yeah. way, but from, yeah. from my perspective, too, there's it's kind of two interesting things. One is, <coughs> one is that um, you can actually have uh, you, know, you can actually have an, an ASIC API, which uh, works across hardware, and so you don't have to make necessarily specific Broadcom specific Mellanox specific yeah. lot drivers. Yeah. Uh -huh. In your in your code base, and also there's the possibility there's the, po the possibility which you know silicon vendors may not like, but we probably like. Uh, anybody who's a customer and uh, probably HP likes is uh, more is commoditizing the the ASICs yeah, as well yeah. um, in a way that you know x86 and and you know yeah. processors or other processors are commoditized. Yeah. At least opening it up. Right. Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, not the, 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 it, it will be at the very least. Yeah. I, I think the story hasn't been. Yeah, uh, hold yet on whether switching silicon can actually commoditize. Yeah. I, I, would, I would argue the x86 isn't really a commodity. These have to be one one company got really successful and everybody uses it, but you know their margins are obviously very healthy. And, and I guess there's the other nice thing that we have. We have the C language, which is maybe like yeah. P4. We can compile it on ARM. We can compile it on x86, and if it produces yeah. a different output, then we say either yeah. the compiler is wrong or the hardware is wrong. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. And, and I think I think P4. Um, I, I, back to the question, where could this end up? If, if we move this system beyond kind of fixed form factor switching, and someone actually uses it for a software sort of machine, a multi-core software machine, so this is you know, ten four threads um, sitting on top, maybe something like NetMap, um, doing high-speed processing. Mm -hmm. I think P four becomes a very um, straightforward way for groups to have a communication about what that what that machine is supposed to do. Because as soon as you start, as soon as you start going into upper layers, you know. Are you building your tables around bridging and routing semantics? It's fundamentally the heart of machine a flow-based um, system. You end up with a lot of a lot of architectural discussions on how you want to do that. And P4 is a good way just to describe one and give it a shot. Mm. Give you an un unambiguous specification of four. Okay. You have two minutes. Two. Uh, <laughs> status. I'll, I'll make sure the, you guys get the slides, but uh, lots lots of lots of code coming together right now. Uh, and in test, um, we're we're still tracking it this summer, but it, it is a it is a firefight right now for sure. Anybody um, could reason why I wrote into the sample tip on that I know you did the trial in as opposed to the table. Uh, I see trial and mentioned it uh, there. Yes, there isn't. Um, we just had we had to pick a target for the first production release, so. There's really not too many June based copper racks out there. It tends to be more of a chassis chipset, right? So XGS <laughs> dominates the current you know, copper rack chipset. We hold to that one. OK, um, we're running out of time. Again, I'll make sure you, you get this. But since you've been part of the community, I, you know, I, would, I would encourage you to provide, maybe even you to ask me later some some candid feedback. Here's what I like. Here's what I think stupid, and here's what you get that. Um, I really would appreciate that feedback. Uh, but it's out there. It's it's you can grab it. You can get you can get started. You don't need a hardware switch. Um, we would like to see more people get involved and have this this thing start to go places that we hadn't considered because I view that as success. So any any other questions? How would you characterize if I was to, you know, if someone in the room is to get their hands on it? How, how well, solid, robust, you know, can you make it? So, um, so BGP convergence is a little slow still. Mm -hmm. uh, it 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 mostly works right now. Um, you can you can get a, a demon to crash. Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually all the bugs are published. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. Up on the website, yep. so people can see. It, it, like I said, there's commits happening every day, yep. so uh, it, it's getting getting more and more stable. It, you know, the the suggestion would be, you know, grab it, um, take a piece of it, and make it your own. Right? Said so to contribute. If someone wants to work on state for replication for chassis. You know, put something out there on the thread. Say, hey, this is a problem I want to work on. I've got some ideas architecturally what should happen. And and you know, right now we're seeing people um, kind of find each other and get going. And and there's. 40, 50, 
different repos. Yeah. Like this, there's there's there are way more code and opportunity than there is people adding to it right now outside of HPD. So the more the merrier we are. Wait, and one of the things that we found that work that that, is, that works very well in getting broad adoption across the research community and sort of you know grad students who are trying to do funky stuff. Hey, you got me. I'm um, awesome. Yeah, really, really is really um, rough developers workshops, summer camps, this kind of yeah. thing. Um, I've seen this happen with hey. platform what we did, but also with various sort of open source. And um, you know, a couple of days having um, forty or fifty people there. If they're coming from you know from schools where they're very actively involved in networking research, you know within six months you start seeing. Contributed, but also you know papers, publishing ideas. But the other thing to remember is that those are the folks who, in a couple of years, are going to be probably working in some yes. of the places they're going to use yes. it, and so they also become users down the road. And we saw that happen a lot with the unexpected consequence of the summer camps that were offered for sort of SDN open floor in the early days. A lot of these people ended up as the people I now see and meet as people building products and companies, right? And so it gets them familiar, and so it's a it's a fairly easy way to do that. To do the training. That was a great yeah. suggestion. I'll go so one step farther and say Adobe's been using Adobe and Mac have been using that strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's and it's great because uh, you know everybody feels good about doing it that way, right? And they get unpatted information early. And if you do it as something that's just especially for um, for for students, graduate students, um, <clears throat> you know, you twice a year. Um, I think you get pretty good attendance. I, I can actually help you sort of, I, sort of think about how to do that and which schools in particular to approach. Um, Let me do it for P four as well. And yeah, there's, let's, let's do that. Yeah, and I'll make an offer though, uh, at least to, to this group, to your group. Yeah, if there's folks that want to get involved with Open Switch yeah. and access to a switch is an issue, get a hold yeah. of me and okay. I'll find a way to get, get a Thank handful you. of switches delivered here for you guys. Thank to, you. To, That'd yeah. be great. Feedback on this. Yeah, and we will use Docker instance or Docker instance mm -hmm. periodically. Mm -hmm. You can download that and import it into the Docker host machine and see it about instance. Nice. That's great. And there is some uh, optional script out there to create and fix Docker instances, communicating each other, and configure those switches even the configuration of those. So there are a lot of tools out there, open source. Great. Any other questions? So, don't need to time. I don't want to take away from any of the questions. I'm very interested. In case, it's not easy to do comments as public information. What's the business model of the HP to go along with that? Probably a, a longer discussion on the line. Very <laughs> but it's what you at the high level responsibility because we've got to run time is you will see us productize support for this like you, would, um, like you would kind of expect in a product like this. There's other, I think again, that other companies will grab it, add code that's not all open source and it gets more integrated more virtually. So I think most of this is probably will happen. So this isn't a question so much as a comment, which is that uh, in addition to some of the things you said, I, I think there's there's real value to having a, a full featured virtual chassis switch that does BGP, that does L3, that does everything. I mean, one thing that, so my name is Bob, I developed uh, Minnet, and you may know that, and, and one of the kind of questions or you know, requests I get all the time is, I want a router in Minnet. And what people mean is, I want a virtual Cisco router. That's usually what they mean. And uh, and I'm like, well, you know. It, you know, you can use an open close, you can use an open flow router. They're like, oh, I don't want to use that. I want a virtual Cisco right. router with the CLI and everything. And so, so, so I just want to say that, you know, having this in Mininet is great for lots of Mininet users. And also just uh, open vSwitch sort of does L2, but having a full featured virtual chassis switch, I think is a really valuable contribution to the virtualized world. Yes. To have this in software as well. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. We've got some work to do there, All right. Let's thank Tom. All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.